Um, I'm very glad to welcome our CERC Research Council member, Dr. Uh, Bill Rouse, as our Innovating for STEM Readiness Series moderator. Uh, we are very lucky to have Dr. Rouse, who, in addition to his uh, Research Council leadership and research roles at CERC and ERIC, uh, is a senior fellow in the Office of the Senior Vice President for Research at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. Uh, Dr. Rouse is a researcher, educator, author, and entrepreneur. Uh, his expertise includes individual and organizational decision-making and problem-solving, as well as design of organizations and information systems. Uh, his current research focuses on understanding and managing complex private and public systems such as healthcare delivery, urban systems and defense, and emphasis on mathematical and computational models of modeling of these systems for the purpose of policy design and analysis. Uh, in short, he's a thought leader in the field and a friend to Sergeant Eric, and we thank you again, Bill, for curating and moderating the series. Okay, thank you, Mimi. Is it all mine now? All yours. Okay, well, this, this is a great treat to get to in, uh, introduce Rich DeMillo as the first speaker in our STEM innovation series. Uh, I've known Rich for 20 plus years. We were colleagues at Georgia Tech for uh, uh, over over 10 years, and uh, for a period of time, we had offices next to each other while Rich was uh, leading the uh, Center for 21st Century Universities, and I was, was leading the Tenenbaum Institute. Uh, Rich has got an amazing resume, uh, including both uh, educational institution affiliations and, and industry accomplishments. Uh, he was the chief technology officer of Hewlett Packard. And that helped us a lot on a study that we did for CERC, that he had had that experience. Uh, beyond that, uh, he was dean of the College of Computing while I was chair of the School of Industrial System Engineering. So we had a, a great number of things in common. And one thing I just discovered today when I was doing my homework to make sure I was ready for this, Rich is six days younger than me, okay? And I didn't realize he was so junior. So <laughs> I'm glad to welcome him here and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation, Rich. It's all yours. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the, for the in invitation, but you've made me feel bad. I'm, 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 um, I'm challenged in the hair department for someone someone my age. Um, you got you got my my crop of uh, of white hair. It looks like. Um, let me let me jump into um, the remarks that 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 I'd like to I'd like to give today um, with. Um, With just just a little a little brief history of where this work um, where this work came from, um, there was a time when 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 Bill Rouse and I uh, gathered gathered some graduate students and faculty members uh, in a seminar to um, um, I'm, I'm not sure that we actually had a goal when we when we got people to, together, but it, it it turned out to be uh, a really interesting gathering of, um, of people who, who are curious about systems properties in, in education, higher ed education in, in particular, and turned into a discussion of, of the evolution of, of colleges um, and universities. Um, at the end of the seminar, uh, the students created a 90-minute a, a PowerPoint presentation, uh, and um, we managed to corral Georgia Tech's president, who at that time was brand new, Bud Peterson, uh, and and um, and his provost, um, Raphael Bras, um, to sit through this this presentation, thinking that 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 they would be just completely bored out of their minds, um, but 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 they sat they, they sat with us for an hour and a half plus, uh, and um, the conclusion of of that of that briefing um, was was a decision to launch a ten year. Uh, initiative um, to address uh, what in the title of my talk I, I mentioned prominently innovation in stem um, in stem education um, so so what you see on the screen here uh, 
are are three um, are three references that I think will help you understand where this came from and provide a little more detail, a little more color uh, as to um, as to what we're um, what we're talking about. I um, as director of the Center for 21st Century Universities, which which at the time was Georgia Tech's living laboratory for studying fundamental change in higher education, um, wrote a couple books on um, on change in, in, in higher education. The one that's really most relevant to this uh, this webinar today uh, uh, is, um, is is called Revolution in, in Higher uh, education, uh, and it's got it's got a very nice forward by uh, Ambassador Andrew um, Andrew Young. Uh, even if you don't get a chance to read the book, I, I would I would encourage you to take a look at Ambassador Young's uh, forward to it. Um, that that book launched a series of of initiatives and um, and projects. Um, one of which is is summarized uh, in in a, a book called The Distributed Classroom. Um, uh, written by um, the current dean of the College of Computing, Charles Charles Isbell, uh, and and one of the um, um, one of the um, thought leaders in in the way that we approached education, particularly online education at, at Georgia Tech, um, David David Joyner, um, and led eventually into into a commission, uh, a five year commission, uh, to to map out educational strategy. Um, the commission started before the pandemic, and and uh, it, it's sort of interesting. And I'll I'll make reference to this as we go along. It's sort of interesting to see uh, the the twists and turns um, that our discussions took, uh, uh, given that people were not showing up on campus uh, for for two years, two years plus, uh, and uh, and some assignments that I um, that I was handed uh, during the, the the pandemic, which turned out to be um, wonderful laboratory experiments that 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 I can tell you a little bit about th this afternoon. Uh, anyway, I've I've got the um, um, I've got the URLs for those uh, for those sources um, on the screen, and I, I think maybe they're they're in a power um, in, a, in a PDF file um, that's available to to attendees. If if you want to follow up on that, uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at those sources. Um, so let me let me let me jump in to to really the end of the story, and 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 I, I think I think it'll um, as we go along, I'll, I'll, I'll fill in the, the details for, for for how we we got here. So in the in the height of the of the pandemic, um, um, after after uh, I had written and um, and published the the commission. Uh, report called Deliberate Innovation. Um, I was asked. I was asked to to create um, a different kind of department at, at Georgia Tech, uh, a school of cybersecurity uh, and and privacy. Which uh, I was I was happy to do. Cybersecurity is my uh, is my my technical specialty. So I, I really had an interest in doing that. Um, and I, I thought it would be a, an interesting way to try out some of the ideas that we had been thinking about uh, for the previous previous ten years or so. Um, and and one of the things that I noticed right away was, was that um, in winter of 2020, um, it was really apparent um, that um, that among the technical skills that the workplace Global workplace was was, was demanding cybersecurity um, was was right up there, um, maybe with with climate change and um, and weapons of mass of mass destruction. In any event, um, the world was shy of uh, of cybersecurity skills to apply to digital trans um, transformation, and um, we engaged we engaged with. Um, with a company called Burning Glass, maybe some of you have heard of, of, of Burning Glass. It's a uh, it's a labor analytics um, um, uh, company. One of the things that they that they do is is track uh, hiring patterns and and skills gaps across a range um, a range of industries. Um, and we did that because because the school that that I was I was creating wasn't a computer science department. It wasn't an engineering school. It was it was an amalgamation. Um, of, um, uh, of of professionals 
uh, and and um, and students who were interested in solving solving problems. Um, and when you think of STEM education, you you sort of think of of bodies of knowledge that are stable over long periods um, of, of time. And it, it became apparent to me early on in the process of forming this school that you couldn't count on that. Um, that, that, that agility was, was really the watchword uh, for this kind, of, um, this kind of training and this kind of, uh, of education. And I hadn't thought of it beforehand, but, but, but we were seeing the same thing in our, our AI initiatives uh, and, and, and a number of new areas um, that didn't really map very cleanly to traditional academic, um, academic departments. And then we had to figure out, so what do you, what do, you do about that? What is this new thing that we're, we're creating? Is it more like an engineering department or is it more like a, oh, let's say a, a school of public health which is not a medical school. It's not a. Uh, it's not a service organization. It's, it's a. It's a combined entity um, that that advances the, the goals of science to create um, uh, action in the community and, and action in um, in society. Um, so when when we when we looked at um, what what skills were in demand, um, one of the things that we noticed was was. I hint at this in the in the title of the of the talk. Not all skills are created equal. Um, uh, in in the world of cybersecurity, um, it makes a big difference whether you're configuring uh, a network router <coughs> for a real estate company uh, uh, or um, uh, or conducting um, um, threat intelligence for for a federal federal agency. And the rewards, the economic rewards, uh, are are different. So for a university like ours. Um, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't necessarily take a look at at the broad sweep of an area like cybersecurity and say, well, we're going to train all kinds of people, people that that have vocational uh, vocational aspirations and people that that want to get PhDs in in, in cybersecurity. We we're, we're going to look uh, at the areas that are are highest in demand, highest growth, um, and and just from a, an economic point of view present the, um, the largest return um, on investment. And that turned out to be a critical thing to do um, because, because it caused us to look at, uh, at what STEM education meant in this context. Um, and I've come to believe in the last couple of years that this is, this is the, the, the dominant context for STEM, for STEM education. Everywhere we look at a place like Georgia Tech, we encounter freshmen. Um, who show up in Atlanta not wanting necessarily to major in electrical engineering, they want to do something and they want to engage in, 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 in problem solving. Uh, we, we, we ran, we ran a, a market study very early in the, in the process uh, and asked incoming freshmen what they, what they wanted to do, thinking we would get choices of majors, uh, choices of, of degrees. Um, and, and what we heard from the incoming freshmen was that I want to do space. Um, I want to do. Uh, um, I want to do ethics. Um, so, 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 what they want to do is they want to tackle, tackle problems, and that's that's the challenge that we had in forming the new um, the new school. Um, now, the the difficulty is that if you look at um, um, at the skills that are used in the marketplace. Um, and just kind of concentrate on these high on, on these high growth skills. None of them map cleanly to academic disciplines. And so the fastest growing skills in um, uh, in this area called application development security, which is which is the the, the highest growth um, uh, uh, set of skills in, uh, in 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 cybersecurity. Uh, you see skills like like um, those that combine um, software development, security operations, and 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 uh, uh, and um, uh, and design uh, into into a single way of looking at um, at at systems. That we don't we don't have a department of of DevSecOps, and we don't have a department of of container security. And you can't even map to to labels for jobs. Um, 
you could be a software developer, you could be a cybersecurity um, engineer. You had to think about how you're going to train people in a very different way. And, and because of the nature of cybersecurity, um, you can't count on, um, on the threshold being, being fixed. The, um, um, the threats were constantly evolving. So, so we would add to this list literally on a monthly basis. Um, and in a normal situation, you would, you would go crazy trying to put together a curriculum that was constantly under, under change and, and under, um, under, under review. Um, that idea kind of struck a chord um, um, with, with us because, because universities don't really work that way. At least they're not comfortable working, um, working that way. So if you, if you we were to take apart the course catalog for a university um, like, like ours, uh, or like most universities, I, I, I guess, um, there would be there would be a bunch of courses um, kind of in the in this yellow cloud that you that you see here associated with with a major field um, that that students have to string together uh, in um, uh, in sufficient numbers to get a to get a degree. But of course, um, you can't just take courses in a major field uh, uh, and, and expect to get a, a degree. Uh, you have to choose a minor field. You have to choose supporting. Um, supporting disciplines. Um, each of those clouds, each of those clouds is owned by faculty members who have been teaching basically the same course for 40 or 50 years. Um, and, and, and they just have a particular way of thinking about how their field, how their field of expertise fits into this larger, larger picture. Um, but when the larger picture is changing, that becomes less and less, less and less relevant. Um, that struck a chord with us, struck a chord with me anyway, because we had addressed a problem like that 10 years before. Um, during the dot-com bust, um, people were, um, high school seniors were, 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 were choosing not to, not to enter computer science as an, academic, as an academic field because the field was changing so rapidly. Outsourcing was, was a concern um, of, of, of parents. And there was really nothing that we could tell them that would say, well, here's a set of core courses. Here's a set of core skills that if you learn these things, um, you're going to be advantaged in the, in the, the job, the job market. They simply didn't, um, didn't exist. Um, I, I had, I had thought about this problem years before. Um, and and I, I can I can kind of tell you the moment that it occurred to me that um, that that nothing like what a university is um, um, addresses these kinds of, of, of problems. So this is the year um, 20, um, 2001, maybe just around around um, um, around that time period, two thousand one, two thousand um, two thousand two, when MIT announced um, the availability of what was called open courseware. Um, they, they would open their course catalog and make online versions of, of the courses and lecture notes available to the world um, for free. And, and there were a number of parallel developments. Um, this, this, this guy, Khan, uh, said, well, I, I, can, I can teach the same material in 10 minute um, videos in a much more um, efficient way. Um, and I, I took him up on that challenge. So um, this, this, um, this slide that you're looking at now is kind of the, the, the end result of this little thought experiment um, that, that, that I, I did. I, I, I took a look at a, a particular topic from MIT's um, uh, open courseware catalog calculus. It was a calculus uh, course. And I, uh, the topic I looked at was called um, the mean value theorem. It's one of the um, it's one of the standard topics in introductory um, introductory uh, calculus, and and I kind of deconstructed what happens in an MIT um, MIT course. So this was lecture fourteen uh, in that um, in that course, and as as you can see, um, there was a lot going on. There's a lot of people in that classroom to begin with, um, uh, and and what's happening uh, is that in lecture fourteen. That little figure at the front of the room is just kind of 
spitting out information at this incredible rate. Um, uh, I counted I counted thirty separate concepts um, that 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 were that were laid in front of the students. A new concept every two minutes um, during the during the the the, the lecture, um, and um, there was homework, but the homework wouldn't be graded until until uh, after the midterm exam um, took took place. It was it was it was an environment where what mattered was was the content that you were trying to get across to students, not the learning that the students um, was was doing and um, were doing. And 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 what I what I concluded from this um, is that because most university lectures look like this, um, what's called the long form the long form um, long form lecture. Um, it was very hard to figure out how to fit any other kind of model, the Khan Academy model in particular, uh, into um, uh, into this. And I kept going back and forth between the 10 minute video that Sal Khan uh, had put online for the mean value theorem um, and, the, and the the 50 minute um, long form lecture uh, at MIT. And and it was it was one of these moments where you conclude <coughs> structural change is needed. And um, and it, it it launched it launched a series of developments, uh, and I'll, I'll outline some of those um, for you right now. But 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 the conclusion is what you should take away from this is is that um, we all go through this this experience of higher education thinking that we know what's going on, uh, thinking that we know um, uh, for for example. Um, why costs are rising uh, in higher education, or, or why uh, why people do or do not get jobs after they get their um, their, their degree, and and almost none of that turns out to be true. Um, so this issue of costs, for example, uh, which is which is a, a driving motivation for for a lot of what we uh, what, what we talk about. If you if you read if you read op-ed pages uh, in the Washington Post or the New York Times, um, you will inevitably see someone saying, "Well, it's 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 a bloated administration, uh, it's lazy professors, it's uh, easy availability of finance." That's what's driving up driving up the the, the costs, um, and that turns out to be bull. Um, uh, costs go up in higher education um, because of um, um, of economic issues, um, mainly macroeconomic uh, issues. So about, about a third of the cost of, of, of um, rising costs in higher education uh, have to do with, with, with macroeconomic factors. The rest are, are, are due to, to, to bad governance decisions on the part of the, of the university installed, um, installed innovation. That's what kind of led to the topic that we're talking about today here. So if you if you think about what goes on in this kind of in this kind kind of world, it's it's the ability to respond to the needs of a marketplace in a way that provides value um, uh, to to students and to do it in an agile um, an agile way. It's almost the opposite of the connotation that most of us have for STEM education, which we think of in terms of mathematics and physics and 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 these principles that remain constant over a long period of, of time. So, so you have to challenge the existing um, existing model. And, and there are really only a few levers that you have um, for doing that. One of them, which sounds like it's extremely difficult uh, to do, turns out to be the, the, the one that, that, the, um, that the community tackled right away. Um, and um, the pandemic helped us kind of put it to um, put it to bed. It's, it's what I call grounded cognitive um, cognitive learning. It's it's the it's the learning that's reinforced by um, by by the natural processes of the um, of the of the brain. Um, if you've ever taken a course in public speaking, for example, um, the, the instructor probably says something to you like the secret to giving a good speech is levity, brevity and repetition. Let me repeat that, uh, and that's that's the that's the joke that leads that leads just about every every uh, um, every course in in public speaking. But but the reason it's a it's a relevant uh, uh, relevant aphorism 
um, is that that's the way the brain learns. Uh, the, the brain learns skills um, by being stimulated, by having that stimulation um, uh, repeatedly um, uh, reinforced and moved into long-term um, long memory. Um, that sounds like a difficult problem to, to solve, um, but, but it turns out to be not the most difficult, difficult problem. The most difficult problem has to do with what's called non-cognitive learning, character skills, sometimes called 21st um, uh, century, um, century skills, things, things like, like grit uh, and, and ethics and, and, and judgment, um, which kind of perversely on, on the part of neuroscientists are called non-cognitive. Um, but, but they're the kinds of things that you learn very early in life. Uh, and you have to deliberately innovate in order to get those, those skills instilled um, um, in, in students. And so if you want to change the way, um, the way people learn, um, you want to invest in the easy things to do, grounded cognitive learning, um, which, which, which we chose to use technology to, to address. Um, but focusing on the non-cognitive um, learning is, um, is really the, the difficult problem and where innovation, um, innovation takes place. Um, and, and you want to do it in a testable way. So, so there's a lot of opinion um, in this area. A lot of what happens uh, it takes place in experiments that that show you what matters and what and what doesn't matter. So the the, the grounded cognitive learning, um, I think I think kind of burst onto the public scene uh, in 2012 um, with the appearance of the Silicon Valley um, uh, platforms for doing massive open online uh, online courses. The Khan Academy was one of them. The, the most famous ones came out of Stanford, um, a company called Coursera, um, uh, a company at MIT um, called edX, uh, and another spin out from from Stanford called um, called Udacity. Like a lot of people, we invested uh, in uh, in massive open online um, online courses. Um, we didn't concentrate necessarily. On, um, on, on having big free courses, although our courses were quite quite large, we ended up with um, with two and a half million students enrolled uh, in the in the courses over the, over the twelve months that it, it took us to build out our um, our, our catalog. Um, um, but we did focus on on what we call the Iron Triangle, which, which is which is uh, increasing productivity to address the rising uh, rising costs of higher education. Um, Using communications technology to improve access uh, to to knowledge, uh, uh, and then and then using measurement uh, and assessment technology to assess um, uh, assess achievement. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on this, but I will tell you that 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 one of the first experiments that we ran um, was was to convert uh, the Georgia Tech master's degree in computer science uh, into a MOOC-based online master's. Um, degree at the time, the, the master's degree in computer science at Georgia Tech was ranked um, three or four in the in the in the in the country, uh, and 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 we we converted the course um, topic for topic, um, uh, instructor for instructor, project for for project into MOOC um, MOOC format, uh, and offered in 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 um, a Coursera. Um, course uh, program uh, course for less than seven thousand dollars so the master's degree at Georgia Tech is about a fifty thousand uh, dollar degree we were able to offer it for seven uh, seven thousand dollars it is today the largest graduate program in in um, in computer science um, in the world and and most importantly uh, it expanded the market for graduate education in computer science by eight percent a year so this one program um, kind of launched as an experiment uh, in this pathway, this innovation pathway that I, I, I talked about, expanded the market worldwide um, by um, by eight eight percent, which we took as a uh, as a sign that there was something there to be investigated. Um, that led that led to to uh, an explosion of, of innovation um, at Georgia Tech uh, uh, and elsewhere. Um, we found AI uh, kind of coming into its own, and we used AI. Uh, I thought uh, that very, uh, very cleverly, we emphasized um, measurement 
uh, and cognitive science and, uh, um, and, and built up innovation pathways for the kinds of things that we wanted to achieve with our, um, with, with our, our students. Some of this is in the books that I mentioned uh, at, at, at the start. Each one has kind of its own interesting history. I, I'd encourage you just to take a gander um, at, at some of those, some of those things. Um, the, the bottom line was, was that, although it sounded like an easy experiment to conduct, it wasn't. Um, all the pieces were there. Uh, um, Stanford had invented the, 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 the format, um, um, but no one had put it together uh, in, um, in something that would go into, let's say, a higher ed authorization uh, um, bill. Uh, and, th and that's what that's what happened with the online masters in, in, in CS. So President Obama visited uh, to announce the inclusion um, of financial aid for uh, for this program in the 2000, I want to say 2012, 2014 reauthorization uh, reauthorization um, act. And that was a very big deal. That 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 led that that led to this positive reinforcement at the leadership levels of the university and, and in the university system of, of Georgia. Um, and um, the fact that it happened so quickly, uh, I, I think deserves kind of, kind of special, special mention. Um, I mentioned when I started my, my comments that, that, that STEM education doesn't like to change very much. And if you have a whole university devoted to, to STEM education, almost no one likes the idea uh, of, of change, um, but you can't impose this kind of change from uh, from inside out. You have to you have to think about how you're going to change things um, from from with um, um, from within. Um, and um, we thought very hard about that. And and the the commission report that I mentioned talks about um, talks about deliberate innovation. We mean that quite seriously. That we we spend a long long time thinking about. How you how you um, how you evolve this innovative discipline? How you measure um, how you measure progress? Um, and just for example, one of the things that we um, that we noticed as a consequence of of, of this is that um, you need to find uh, levers that you can pull. I mean, literal literal uh, level le levers. We 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 borrowed this term trim tabs uh, from Buckminster Fuller. And if, if you're not familiar with with the the, the, the metaphor, it's a, it's a really it's a really interesting one. Fuller um, fashioned himself as a uh, as a personality who could who could change the direction of of large um, large enterprises, um, and 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 he used this example uh, of a trim tab, a, a small piece of metal on the rudder of a of a boat, let's say, um, that has has the the characteristic that if you if you move the lever a little bit, it creates a region of low pressure uh, around around the rudder, and because because there's so much momentum in the ship, uh, uh, that region of low pressure grows exponentially, pulls the rudder in, and causes the causes the ship to to turn. So, what we thought was that the online masters um, in computer science was was actually a trim tab. Um, um, it didn't cost us very much. To try it out, um, it, it it cost us some uh, uh, some social capital because because um, it it could have been it could have been a, a divisive um, divisive topic for a traditional university, um, but it was such an obvious success that it drew people uh, it drew people in. So so the idea of looking for these low risk high payoff uh, projects to to uh, to nurture innovation. Um, became a part of what we what we um, what we articulated as as our our philosophy for for change. In the middle of all of this, to get back to my my um, my um, assignment to create a department of of cybersecurity um, and privacy, um, the university shut down. Um, I mean, COVID COVID kind of took away in-person uh, in class, um, classes, um, but, but we had already invested um, in distributed classrooms. We had already invested uh, in online 
um, uh, online education. And so, so the things that could have happened um, badly at Georgia Tech, and they happened, they happened at other institutions, uh, for example, organized resistance to online learning, just didn't affect us um, at all. We already had a large portion of our, of our students engaged in online, um, online education. The pandemic actually allowed us to hit a pause button um, to, um, to take a deep breath and, and figure out where we were gonna take, uh, take this, this kind of development. Um, next, um, we saw enrollment spikes. Um, we, went, we went from, um, from maybe um, 15,000 um, uh, applicants, freshman applicants a year to 35,000. Uh, uh, and um, the capacity of Georgia Tech was nowhere near what it would have taken. Um, to service that many freshmen without the online, without the online program. So, so it 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 allowed us to um, uh, to take things at a more considered considered pace, but it also allowed us to stress um, the um, the scaling strategy that we had um, that we had had chosen. Um, and 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 the fact that it was happening while everyone else was undergoing change was a big um, competitive advantage for. So. Um, so, so we made it through this period of time, um, and and to the point where where we could launch a new a new kind of department um, uh, with a lot of momentum behind what we were what we were doing. So here we are um, uh, after um, uh, after the, the 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 revolution. A lot of things have changed. Um, I would say the 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 issue um, among research universities, the the issue of online delivery um, as a source of of, of, of conflict uh, is essentially is essentially dead. Um, um, hybrid delivery, online uh, online delivery, uh, is, um, is is now nowhere near the hot button that it was when we um, when we started. Um, some of the issues. Um, that we see talked about in the in the, the press today, um, we think can be attacked with the same kind of approach to um, um, to to innovation. Uh, you know, it's just by by accident. Um, I'm giving this talk um, at about the same time that that the president announced the um, the debt forgiveness program for um, for subsidized uh, student student loans, um, and again, like like the case of, of learning, almost nothing that you read uh, in the op-ed pages applies to what really happens in, in, in higher education. Um, debt forgiveness for for subsidized Stafford loans, for example, is not going to be is not going to be paid for by taxpayers. Um, it will eat into the profits that the Department of Education made from from running essentially a, one of the world's largest lending institutions. Um, but 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 that's not that's not quite the picture that's painted in the um, in in the in the press. Um, um, you also hear you also hear uh, a lot of discussion about well not everyone needs a college degree uh, and and so we should we should de-stress the system by discouraging people um, uh, who don't need the degree from 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 getting. Um, a degree, which is probably true. I mean, not everyone needs needs a, a college degree. If, if your if your um, um, if your career is flipping burgers for 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 a living, you probably don't need a college degree to do that. But what's known, for example, uh, is that um, if you're if you're flipping burgers uh, at at the local In and Out, you're better off with a college degree. Your long term your long term earning potential, regardless of what you do. Uh, uh, is is affected by the by the premium that you get for having um, having a credential post secondary um, a credential, um, and I hate to say it, but 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 a lot of the discussion has to do with um, has to do with um, the cost increases that are inevitable um, in 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 higher education. And let me just mention too, because I I started off by by by, by talking about this. Um, Higher ed prior to the appearance of, of online education was, was systematically resistant to productivity improvements. Um, uh, and, and there's a lot known about the macroeconomics of service industries that work, um, that work like, like this. There's a cost disease that has to do with, with cross elasticity uh, of skills 
uh, uh, in in marketplaces where 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 you don't get the benefits of productivity um, increases in higher education it's called the cost disease, uh, uh, Baumol cost co uh, cost disease. Um, you know we 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 have um, uh, we have a situation where where the the skills that are in most demand uh, are the ones that that command in the in the industry uh, the, the the highest salaries and 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 that. That's a um, that's a um, uh, that's a um, uh, that's a feature that 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 we all that we all deal with. Hang on a second. Um, about thirty percent of, of 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 cost increases in higher education are due to 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 that um, to that co uh, cost disease. Um, the the other two thirds are, are kind of allocated between just increases in in in, in cost because organizations are getting larger um, and and the incentives that universities have for spending every dollar that they um, that they that they that they they take in um, those are well understood and 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 one of the things that we're we're thinking about is is, is how you attack the um, the governance problem. Um, and then, and then to come back to where we started, uh, the world has become interdisciplinary, uh, and uh, and doing things in disciplinary stovepipes makes less and less, less and less sense. So, to conclude, um, how do you how do you organize for this kind of for this kind of of, of, of innovation? Um, I think I think I think. One of the things that you can do is is is, is take the, the the Bucky Fuller model very seriously and, and and say if you're trying to change something that has a lot of momentum behind it, like um, like higher education, uh, you're better off finding some way to make the way current way of doing business obsolete rather than than taking it uh, taking it head on. It helps certainly helps to have a philosophy uh, for for change. Uh, it certainly helps to not require universities to become different um, uh, different creatures. Um, it certainly helps to not impose artificial time constraints on 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 uh, on the um, on the time horizon that you that you ha have in mind. Um, and then, um, you know, we all know the importance of culture. Um, you 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 don't want to just throw money at the problem. You what what, what you want to do is have this sense of deliberate innovation. Um, that moves you along a path uh, towards the goal that you um, that you want. Um, so you put all that together, and um, and you, you get you get a view of of a new kind of uh, a new kind of, of educational model that's 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 agile. Um, it does make existing models obsolete, um, and and you can see that on a daily um, on a daily basis. Um, I kind of break it into three three large categories um, of um, of change that um, that have to be dealt with. One is the churn of knowledge. Um, whatever you think is happening in higher education, it's reflecting uh, exponential change uh, in the in the, the the marketplace. So 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 whatever whatever you um, you instill in students um, has to be reflective of this idea that uh, um, that that. Their jobs are going to be um, subject to continual continual change, and and so innovation has to be built in into their their training. These are the non cognitive uh, skills that we um, that we talked about. Um, measuring what you do is a is a, a really important um, concept. Um, so so paying renewed attention to the science and technology of education, which means not educational psychology, not um, um, not um, um, Thirty-person um, blind experiments, but but actual cognitive science and behavioral economics, um, using data analytics uh, and 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 the convergence of technologies to um, um, to to, um, to transfer technology uh, into into education. And um, this this last topic um, that I was I was mentioning has to do with. With um, with the way that people succeed uh, in in post university university years, and, and I I, uh, um, I I make I make reference to this idea of, of the Gatsby curve, 
um, you know, the, the, um, um, the um, um, social psychologists um, measure character skills that matter um, in in Western Western countries, and and the ones that that have the most impact on intergenerational wealth transmission, um, uh, really um, really reflect the fact that that students, particularly students in the U.S., although although you, you find this elsewhere in the world too, um, have have access affordable access to to educational experiences um, that reinforce. Um, Teamwork that, re that reinforce judgment, that, re that reinforce uh, ethical ethical um, decision making, that reinforce um, um, grit, uh, and and all of those are things that 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 you normally think of as being instilled in, in children at a very young age, but um, but you can approach those um, later in life, and 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 that's a that's a, a big target of innovation. For, um, um, for for higher higher education, and given given the way that these fields are going, I, I think I think that, that these are the the sorts of things that you can um, that you can focus on. Um, so I think I'll, I think Bill, I think I think I'll I'll stop there. There's there's lots of room for for discussion and um, and the things that, that that we were talking about. Um, but looking back over the last um, uh, ten or fifteen years, these are the lessons that we learned from our, our experiences at Georgia Tech. You're muted, Bill. How do you think these ideas might apply to, say, the arts and the humanities? Um, it, it, it's an uncomfortable discussion um, because because uh, um, training in the arts and humanities isn't done with a view towards success in in the job market. Um, and, and so, so you have to get over, we've had this discussion over and over again, but, but you have to get over the following hurdle. Um, you, uh, as a political scientist, um, um, view your, your, your activity as scholarly activity that has value independent of, um, of where people get jobs, whether they get um, whether they get jobs, and, and the same thing happens in all of the humanities, all of the uh, all of the, the 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 liberal liberal arts. Um, you have to get beyond that point, uh, and um, there are some places that do it that do it well. I don't think, to be honest, I don't think Georgia Tech does it particularly well. Every every time we have that discussion, uh, it's like starting with a blank sheet of paper. Um, but um, Harvey Mudd, for example, does it very well. Uh, so, so um, uh, Maria Clave, um, um, when she when she structured the math curriculum at at, at Harvey Mudd, um, built communications into the math curriculum. So, so you had um, you had teachers of of um, of English uh, co-teaching with math professors um, the same courses that would have been taught at a place like Georgia Tech um, uh, as a calculus course. Um, but but it had had an impact on on how mathematics was communicated, not only to the students but how the students conceived mathematics as something that can be communicated to a non uh, a non mathematician. Sounds like an abstract concept, but but you know Harvey Mudd had a reputation for producing producing um, technologically trained university graduates who went into policy positions. Uh, and were success was successful at it. So, so you could argue that 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 they were primed to consider, at least subconsciously, to consider um, the, the the job market in the way that they conceived the the curriculum. Um, as long as you're within the stovepipe, um, there's a kind of self consistency that 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 that, that takes place. Um, but it's not it's not not the kind of self consistency that leads itself to this kind of of, of innovation. Certainly not to this kind of agility. Yeah, you know, another area that I'm interested in your opinion on uh, our studies of the last couple of years have paid a lot of attention to the K through 12 pipeline. And um, basically thinking that that's one of the constraints on the STEM talent pipeline is the, is the talent coming into the university. And we've been really surprised at how the best K through 12 institutions in the country are really good, but there are a lot of them that are really bad. 
really bad. Yeah. And uh, hey, you have any thoughts on that? It's 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 the it's the it's the downside of regulation, I think. So 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 yes, uh, um, it's it's hard it's hard to change uh, K through K through twelve. Um, it wasn't something that we that we took on directly. But if you if you look at the at the deliberate innovation report, um, the overlay for the report is is breaking down um, the silos between different kinds of education. Um, so, so, so we, we're, we're big fans of mastery learning, for example, which moves students along, uh, along a learning curve um, as they as they master concepts, not necessarily according to grades. Um, the, the the public, um, um, the, the, the the state education um, system in, in in Georgia, not the individual schools, because there's a problem with 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 individual schools in, in a state like Georgia, but but the Department of Education um, has done a lot with using technology uh, to bring students uh, further further along. Um, we're we're big fans of distributed presence, so 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 putting uh, university expertise uh, in the hands of people that wouldn't normally have access to it. These could be teachers, they could be um, they could be be parents. Uh, has a big impact. On that, and then, and then, because most students won't get that experience, reinforcing it by the time they hit their university years. So, so, so taking these these malleable non-cognitive skills and figuring out methods for teaching um, them to freshmen before they get too deep into their um, into their their particular expertise um, has has a, a, a big impact. Um, that has to be done face to face. That 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 it's very difficult with current technology to figure out how that how that would work. Although there are indications that AI would would help that would help that that somewhat. But 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 getting getting rid of this of the of the uh, uh, of the artificial barriers between the various phases of education is the first step that you have to take. Yeah, it struck it says struck me that fourteen thousand independent school boards maybe not be a good idea. But but you know there's no intermediate intermediate point. We we don't we don't have a Ministry of Education in the U.S., um, which I think is a good thing. Uh, uh, and 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 we we have we have this this kind of um, chaos of local decision making um, that you have to navigate navigate through. I think part of um, part of the difficulty has been that we um, that we haven't paid much attention. So so. When we started on the on looking at the non-cognitive skills, um, it was very difficult to get the discussions going because people thought that they were doing it already. They thought that they were looking at teamwork because they did projects uh, in their um, in their their, their classes. Um, but 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 they didn't consider sources of cognitive bias. They didn't consider um, uh, sources of, of effective team um, effective team membership and and, and how you um, how you how you measure that. How you fit that into a curriculum, I think, is a significant, significant challenge. That's part of the agility process. Maybe, maybe courses uh, and and degrees, um, major major de degree requirements, um, are a barrier to getting that done. Yeah, I'm looking through the chat here, trying to find any other questions we have in the remaining couple of minutes. Uh, if anyone wants to, uh, most of these chat things are just comments about things to go look at. They're not questions. Uh. Yep, and apologies again. I believe the, the chat was disabled, uh, unfortunately, in the back end for participants. But please do feel free to use the Q&A module to submit your questions or comments or send them over to certtalks at there's, there's, there's nothing right there now other than a thank you for a great talk. Thank you. The, uh, <clears throat> it's been interesting. I've been uh, paying attention to charter schools and um, there was an article by Jay Matthews in the uh, post about idea, which is in the, uh, the River Valley, very, very impoverished area in Texas. And uh, they are one of the top 10 high schools in the country in terms of achievement. And 95% of their students live below the poverty level. And basically what they do is they require every student to take every advanced placement course. 
and 11, there's 11 of them, I guess, and they have to take the tests. And the students do it now. It requires a huge commitment from parents, not financial commitment, but time commitment. But it, but it, at least it shows it, it can work. It well, I mean, the, the the anecdotal evidence is 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 pretty is pretty compelling. Um, the um, the experimental side of it, I think, is 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 underdeveloped. But we we know we know some of the some of the keys. So self-efficacy is one of these one of these key character values. Um, mm -hmm. that, that that seems to be present in all, all of the non uh, non cognitive skills. So so the confidence that you can approach a problem and be successful at at, at solving it uh, is something that comes to you uh, through repetition. Again, it's the levity brevity repetition um, um, uh, argument. But but you have to do it early enough in life um, so that so that it becomes ingrained. But but you can you can tell. Um, um, you, you can tell the students that have had these experiences uh, early in life um, in, in, in really sterile situations. So, so, so GEDs, for, for example, kind of separate out people that, that, have, that have cognitive skills um, um, that, that, that can be tested for. If you, if, you take, if you take people that go through GED exams and separate those that, that when you test for self-efficacy, uh, or not, what you find is a predominant predominance um, uh, in um, uh, in students that have been successful at something else, previous some academic enterprise previously um, mm -hmm. to that. We don't we don't make much use of that um, going uh, going forward. But but it, it it shows up in a lot of ways. So so the um, the bias against against uh, females in, uh, in engineering and, and science, for for example, is as much is much a, a, a indictment of, of, of lack of self-efficacy instilled at an early age as it is for for something more active um, taking place. And 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 there are a lot of there are a lot of areas like that where if you if you look at the behavioral economics underlying the value, you will see something that you can measure and something that you can reinforce. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very compelling. Well, thank you. We've hit our timeline. Uh, thank you very much for actually a fascinating talk. It's good to reconnect with you. It is. It, it, it's, it's, it's great. It's good to revisit these, these, these concepts. I hope you keep in touch. Okay. Well, thank you very much.